Thank you for listening to Gateway Church's Sermon of the Week with Pastor Chris Monaghan. I hope you are enjoying these messages on the book of Revelation. For books and other resources, go to www.igateway.org. Ready to get into Word. How many appreciate the Word of God? The Word of God is your ground wire that keeps you grounded. I've ever touched something. I remember I hooked up a dishwasher one time. Don't ask me to hook up your dishwasher. Um, I remember it was a shocking experience when you touched that dishwasher. And if things are not grounded, if, you, if you're touching people and, and they're, they're, they're not getting empowered, they're getting shocked, you're probably not grounded enough in your life. I may have been touched by somebody before that wasn't grounded. Yeah. But we don't want to disconnect the power wire either, because that's what a lot of churches do, is they disconnect the power from the Word of God. How many know He heals the sick? He casts out devils. Raises the dead. Start with bugs, you know what I mean? Start small. Raise some bugs from the dead or some birds or something. You know, start, get, you know, get your faith level up there, but you got to start somewhere. But Jesus said, you are in error because you do not know the Scriptures nor the power of God. So we will be in error if we don't embrace both the power of God and the Word of God. We have to do both. So this morning, we're going to continue our talk on the book of Revelation. Notice it is the book of Revelation, singular. It's one revelation. It is the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ. The goal that I have for you is no longer will you be scared to read the book of Revelation because you think it's all about the end of the world, the Antichrist, the uh, beast showing up and marking people. You know, there's levels of truth in some of that teaching, and but I'm here to tell you today the focus is it's an unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just to prove it to you, let's look at Revelation 1.1. Tells you right off. Tells you right what is... I mean, how many are label readers here? You want to know what's in the food. So what's the first thing you do? You read the ingredients. Here we have Revelation 1, which is the Greek word ap apocalypsis, which means... Apo means to remove. Calypto means a veil. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist, not the end times, not the end of the world. So our goal today is that you will walk out of here looking forward to meet Jesus in a whole different way when you read the book of Revelation. How many think that's a good plan? And we're going to continue in part three today, and we're going to be talking about the seven churches. We're going to continue to go through and finish up the last three churches in Revelation chapter 3. We did Revelation 2 last week, and we'll be going into Revelation chapter 3. And many books of Revelation begin by saying the vision is about Jesus, but they devote hundreds of pages to discussing the Antichrist, the tribulation, the end of the world, and little explanation of how these events real G reveal Jesus. And that's my heart today that when you're reading this book, you will step back from this end-of-the-world mindset and say, I want to see Jesus in this book. How many think seeing Jesus is a good plan right here? And when we look at the letters, now remember, um, and I hope you guys don't do this, but you should never read other people's mail. And that's what you're doing this morning. You're reading a letter to another church. You're, we're opening up their mail, and we're looking at a letter that wasn't written to us specifically, but can I tell you that this letter is written for us? So we're not like reading other people's mail. Anyway, it feels like it though a little bit. And we have to understand that this letter was written also to a particular people in a particular time. There is a, a map I have of the seven churches. It's a map of, they would call it Asia. And you can see, hopefully, that it, it goes in a circle. So our first church that we talked about, Ephesus, and then it goes in a circle from Smyrna, Thyatira, Pergamum, and then we'll finish out today with Sargis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And a lot of scholars actually believe that this is a prophetic timeline of the church, different age periods that each church represents. 
Now, there could be some truth in that. Like they would try to say like the church at Ephesus was when the apostles were alive and then from around 100 to 330 AD, then it was the, 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 Sar, the Smyrna church and then the Thyatira church was a thousand years. And, and so there's a lot of studies. Anybody ever read Hal Lindsey's books? I mean, Hal Lindsey wrote The Late Great Planet Earth was the most, in, most read book besides the Bible in, in the last century. So that's pretty powerful. But can I tell you, because we end with the church of Laodicea, I'm cautious to say, yeah, this is prophetic of how the end will be. Because guess who the last time period is? It's the church of Laodicea, which is the backslidden church. Now, can I tell you that it could be, it, they could be trying to say this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, we're supposed to be lukewarm anyway. So we don't have to do anything. Praise God, the end of the world's getting worse. It's here. Uh, well, I'm not sure if that's a good plan. But I want to tell you that when we look into this, that these were actual churches with actual problems that had to be dealt with. And these were written, what I believe, prior to 70 AD. Does anybody know what happened in 70 AD? Does anybody know? The Jewish temple was destroyed. Now I'm going to, as your pastor, you need to know this date, 70 AD. Most of us were never trained that this was an important date, but when the temple was destroyed, 40, exactly 40 years after Jesus was crucified, the Jewish temple was destroyed. And when the Jewish temple was destroyed, that means that the centrality or the center focus of Judaism was completely destroyed. And it was prophesied that that would happen. It was a significant event, an extremely significant event. And so when we get into reading the book of Revelation, it's possible that a lot of the warnings and a lot of the doom and gloom that you are reading in the book of Revelation is not about the end of the world or the end of time. It's not before us, but it was actually to prepare the Jewish people for what they were about to face when the temple was destroyed. So that's why I take the position that this book has, was written prior to the temple being destroyed. So there's a letter that is written, and it's to the church of Sardis. Everybody say sardine. No, not sardines, Sardis. The church of sardines. No one goes there. Instead of coffee, they serve sardines. And uh, no, it's Sardis. And Sardis was a church that Jesus is writing to. And Jesus is giving them a report card. He gives seven report cards. And these were not the only churches that were in existence, but I believe they were purposely chosen because their message, the message Jesus gave to them, was not only just for them, but it's for us today. I love the Word of God. And so I believe what Jesus is saying to the Sardis church is he's saying, be watchful. If you have a, a bulletin, you can fill it in. Be watchful. That is such an important thing for us to know, to have our eyes cleared out, to be undistracted and focused on Jesus. Our eyes have to be clear so that we can see and hear what the Spirit is saying in these times. Because there are so many voices that are going on in the world today. We have to have that discernment and be watchful. Everybody say, be watchful. So Sardis, it's, it, it means, can mean those who have escaped or red ones. If you've ever heard of the Sargis jewels. But twice in history, this city fell to its enemies because it was not alert and watching. How many know this is a good message for us today? Yeah. We have to be alert and watching. Yeah. And the history of this city, it, it, it tells us because of the position of this city, it was very easy for them to think everything was okay when it was not okay. Sargis was a, was a city that was set atop a hill with sheer cliffs all around, and these cliffs are at a 90 degree angles and incredibly difficult to climb. Sargis was fortified to prevent attack, and the city was considered by many to be impregnable. So understand, this is the position that this church had in mind. We are, we are in an impregnable city. 
And it goes on to say, Jesus says to them, write the following message to the congregation of Sardis. He says, I know that all that you do, and I know that you have a reputation for being really alive, but you're actually dead. You can say amen or ouch, right? And they're like, well, thanks, Jesus. I thought this was a build up, lift up, cheer up church. What? You know? How many know Jesus has a letter for each of us? He's telling us, he's giving us a report card. He goes on to say, wake up and strengthen all that remains before it dies, for I haven't, I haven't found your works to be perfect in my sight. And there's a difference. We can find this happening oftentimes even in the spiritual world. People aren't discerning between what's hype and what's of the spirit. We can have a, a church that's, that's hyped up and excited, which I believe in joy. I believe in 10 seconds of laughter randomly because it's important to me. Sometimes, now I provoke them. I say, we're going to do 10 seconds of seriousness. And then they laugh. They don't, you know, no one listens to me. It's terrible. I believe in, in the joy of the Lord. I believe, but sometimes we mistake hype for things of the spirit. So we have to have a discerning spirit. Just because it's emotional doesn't mean it's God. You understand? Just because it's the right things are said doesn't mean it's the Lord. And we have to do that in our own lives. Because many times, I believe, I think I'm hearing from God. And then I'll talk with other people. And they're like, eh, oh, maybe not. You understand? That's, we all have blind spots. And we all need to sometimes trust others around us. You should always have healthy people around you that you can bounce your crazy ideas off of. Because how many know the spirit of stupidity is easy to step into? How many are familiar with the spirit of stupidity? Right? And walked in that spirit before. It's not a good plan. Not a good plan. But Jesus says, wake up, strengthen all that remains before it dies, because I have found your works not to be perfect in the sight of my God. So remember all the things you received and heard. Then turn back to God and obey them. For I will, if you continue to slumber, I will come to you like a thief, and you'll have no idea what hour that will be coming. And we're warned in the scriptures to be sober and to be alert. 1 Peter 5, 8, be, be sober and always alert because your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion looking for prey to devour. We don't want to be edible to the enemy. We don't want to be attractive to the enemy. We want to be aware of the enemy's plans and purposes. I want to look like Daniel when they threw Daniel into the lion's den. Many people believe that was a miracle that he didn't get eaten by the lions. But the dude was like 95 years old when they threw him in there. So the lions probably looked at him and said, you want beef jerky tonight? Nah. <laughs> Jesus says the enemy has nothing in me. The enemy has nothing in me. The only thing the devil has to offer you is power, a feeling of power, or the ability to numb yourself from being powerful. When I discovered this, I got so happy because it reminded me, the only thing I need to do is recognize my power comes from what Jesus did 2,000 years ago for me. I'm already powerful. I don't need any of the enemy's power, or I don't need to feel powerful, or if I'm feeling powerless, I'm just going to numb myself with some kind of addiction, drug, pornography, to numb myself because I feel so small. No, my power comes from not my work, but from what Jesus did. You understand how powerful that is? You understand how the enemy is going, crap. They know now. I can I only had, that was my only tool. But when you understand the spiritual, how the enemy works, and he flees, he looks at you like you're beef jerky now. Not in the mood for that. I want to gnaw on that. But Jesus goes on to say to the church of Sargis, he says, yet there are still a few in Sargis who have remained pure, and they will walk in fellowship with me in the brilliant light, for they are worthy. Amen. 
And then Jesus gives, and remember, in almost every letter, he builds them up. He says he's got to work on this area. He gives them some promises. I mean, I love the promises of God. Now, for the church of Sardis, they didn't get anything positive to say about him. They're, they're, he didn't have any positive words of encouragement. And it, there are times that that happens. But for the majority of these letters, Jesus is encouraging them. But there's always a promise at the end. And oftentimes you'll read it, to him who overcomes, I will give you the right, or I will give you this, if you overcome. It's almost as he's separating maybe people who believe, they confess Jesus, but they're not in that level of overcomers. Come on, how many have known you? You know a lot of Christians out there. You know some that are like, other no, Christians, hopefully. But then there's others. You look at them as, that brother's an overcomer. You can see that sister's an overcomer. How many want to step into that place of being an overcomer? These are the people that get the promises, the special promises. <laughs> so Jesus says this. He says, in, and the one who experiences victory or the one who overcomes will be dressed in white robes and will never, no, never erase your name from the book of life. I will acknowledge your name before the Father and his angels. Now, when I was a young man, I used to work in the food business, and I always thought that there's two things. I used to see painters, and I used to see people in the food business, and they always wore white. Now, as a young person, I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm thinking, that's pretty stupid. Why would you wear white in the food business? Because the moment you spill something on, you're like, everybody sees it, and now you got to go clean it. Or a painter, you know, if they, get, they, if they get any coloring on them, then immediately it's like, oh, look, you got paint on you. And the whole idea with wearing white is because you can't hide it. In imagery, if you're a religious person, you wear colored garments so you can hide your imperfections. But if you're an overcomer, you're going to wear white because anything that's going on in your life, you want it to be seen. You want it to be noticed. I want to notice is there something in my life, Lord, that you want me ch to change at this point? You wouldn't know that if you weren't wearing white. Now, the other cool thing, and this is a young man I didn't know about, there's this substance called bleach. It works great on white clothes. But how many husbands tried washing clothes before? It doesn't work so well on colored clothes, does it? It doesn't do the same purpose. But the blood of Jesus is what bleaches to clothes, is what the blood of Jesus is to an overcomer, what they wear. So for us as believers, I'm going to put on white. That means I'm vulnerable, I'm open, I admit, yeah, I've got some issues. I'm not perfect, my wife's perfect, but you know, for me, you know, I have to work on these things. She isn't, you know, anyway. We have to, we have to let... We have to wear white, you and I. Let's go on to the next church. This is the church of Philadelphia. In Sardis, the warning is to be watchful. Because in the history of Sardis, they, two times their city was taken over because they put down their guard. And can I tell you, what a message for the church today. What a message for you and I. Guys, you have to be awake. You have to be aware. There's so much propaganda going on in our society right now. You have to, I have to buy my news now. I don't know about you. I decided a couple years ago, you can either be lied to for free or you can pay for the truth. Can I pastor you this morning? 90% of the media that you're listening to is from six, six sources. Three out of every two people are good at math too. It's from six sources. That means if the enemy can convince these six sources to believe a lie, they'll pass it on to you. And can I tell you that whatever the media is crushing or hiding, that's where the truth is. The candidate that they're going after the most is the one you need to vote for. Absolutely. You ought to be watchful and don't put your guard down. The church of Philadelphia was the next church. Philadelphia 
Any pens? I'm a Pennsylvania here. Can anybody else born and raised in Pennsylvania? I know some of you. Okay, maybe not. Okay. Uh, that's us. But Philadelphia typically means brotherly love. And this city had experienced a terrible earthquake. They had ex actually experienced two earthquakes, one in A.D. 17 and another one in around A.D. 68. So I believe that Jesus was writing to a people that had just experienced terrible loss. And they, but he gives them promises that are very particular to the church of Philadelphia. Now, when I translate the name Philadelphia, uh, the noun Adelpha, so you have Philo. Philo means to love in the Greek. It means, it means a friendly love. It means a love of friends. And the city was believed to be named after a king who gave this city to his brother, and his brother was faithful. His brother was loving. His brother never betrayed him. He was devoted to his older brother. And so the king gave us the name Philadelphia. It meant love between two brothers. But it can also mean just love from someone who came from the same womb as I did. Brothers of a different mother. I don't know. That's a picture of what we are in Christ. Christ was the firstborn of all creation. And we are created in that same womb to be devoted to Jesus. How many devoted people here to Jesus Christ, right? That's what it means. It's not just being obedient to the Lord, not being obedient just to his word, but being in love and devoted to the one who is the word of God, Jesus Christ, that personal relationship. So Delphos can actually mean just someone who is born from the same womb. You know, we're, we're, we're a brothers of another mother, we would say. But verse 7, Jesus writes, he says, Write the following to the message of the congregation of Philadelphia. For these are the solemn words of the Holy One, who opens doors that no one can shut and closes doors that none can open. How many know that there are doors that God is about to open for you? that no one can shut. And there are doors that he's going to close that that means they're going to stay closed. We have to know and be praying. I pray this prayer every day. God, I pray for open doors and boldness to be able to walk through those. How many know God doesn't want us walking through doors that he doesn't open? How many have tried that before? Not a good plan. I want to walk through the doors he's opened and then have the boldness to walk through those without fear. Because there are so many, like we're in a crisis right now. And <laughs> the Chinese word for crisis means dangerous opportunity. So we're in a crisis, but we have a dangerous opportunity to impact people, to see things shift and break that we've never seen shift and break before. There's a hunger out there, there's a need out there. This is the season of the local church. So we have to be devoted, like the people in Philadelphia, trusting that God has opened doors for us. Paul prayed this in Colossians 4.3. He had said, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. How many know that God wants to open doors for you to proclaim his word? We're praying for open doors and for boldness. That's what we're asking for. He goes on to say to the church of Philadelphia, I know all that you've done. Now I've set before you a wide open door that none can shut. For I know that you possess only a little power, yet you've kept my word and haven't denied my name. Isn't that great to hear? The devoted ones did not deny the name of Jesus. And so we see there's a promise to the church of Philadelphia that... They're going to become a pillar. They're going to become stable. How many have ever experienced an earthquake before? Okay. What, what was the level of the earthquake? Eh. Eight? You experienced an eight level earthquake? Where? Woo. Okay. Wow. We're glad you're here today, though. <laughs> I might want to sit on the other side of the... No, we're just kidding. We know. Eight, a level eight earthquake. So, and what happens after you experience that kind of level of earthquake? You feel unstable. It's trauma in your lives. And, and what they say in the land of Philadelphia, that there were continuous tremors that were continuing on 
throughout their history. And so they were always kind of in that amygdala mode, always kind of like nervous. And I love what Jesus said to them. He says, I'm going to make you a pillar. I'm going to make you stable. How many know the world around us right now is shaking? But you and I, we find that place of rest. We become a pillar in his temple when we get into his presence. Because we're not of this world. We can have peace even though everyone else around us is in chaos. Because we know the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. We can trust in him. And so we see that this was a town that was devastated. He goes on to say to them, because you passionately kept my message of perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of proving that is coming to test every person on earth. How many know that you can expect to be tested? Like God doesn't tempt you, but he does test you. See, the devil tempts us to destroy us. God tests us to approve us. So when we're going through a test, we're like, oh, I'm going to pass. God wouldn't give me this test unless I was ready to pass it. And once I pass it, I get to go to the next level. Some of you should be excited about that, but that's okay. How many want to go to the next level, right? What do you do before you go to the next level? You get a test. Quit whining about your test. Just take it. Pass it and move forward, right? Because we're all going to be tested. And like, Lord, I want to be faithful in this test because I want to move on to the next level. You know, we can walk in the flesh or we can walk in the spirit. When we walk in the spirit, we get elevated. We get awarded by God, rewarded. When we walk in the flesh, we don't. And it, sometimes it comes down to the simple response to your spouse or response at your job or simple response to your children. Lord, help me give the right response. The response of the Spirit, not of the flesh. Amen. You are a quiet group today. Gee, come on. Okay. So he goes on to say, um, he talks about perseverance, but he says, I will come swiftly, so cling tightly to what you have so that no one may seize your crown of victory. And he, then this is the promise. He says, for the one who is victorious or the one who overcomes. We have any overcomers in the house this morning, okay? I will make you to be a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, permanently secure. That's a promise from Jesus. And he says, I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, descending from our God out of heaven, and I will write my own name on you. Now, this is, this is kind of odd, isn't that? This is, this is imagery that we're like, Whoa, what's that? What's, what's this new Jerusalem thing coming down from heaven? And notice that we see that he says, I'm going to write on you the name of my God, the name of the city. And, a, and he, he's just telling him, like, he's, you are going to be like a new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. Now, it is possible, like you said, when you read the Revelations 21, it talks about a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. How many have read that at the end of the book? How many cheated and read the end of the book already? You got to find out the ending. All right, how's this going to how's this going to end? But what if is is that something that will I believe it will it will happen physically in the future? But can I tell you this? What if that event is supposed to happen right now. That we are the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Now, I've never thought this way before, but when I'm discovering as I'm reading, because I'm getting this end time mentality out of my mindset, I'm thinking, what if this is for now and the church is actually a, a, like a spiritual new Jerusalem? And let me give you some more thoughts on this. He goes on to say that when we talk about Jerusalem, and let me read this in Revelations 21, 3. We're at the end of the book, sorry. And I heard a loud voice from, there, from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. How many believe that's happening now? That we are the new temple. We are the temple of skin. Like people are saying, there's going to be a third temple. 
We are the third temple. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> so many people, there's got to be a third temple built in Jerusalem. No, it doesn't. The third temple is already being built. It's us. So I'm going to continue reading. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Amen. So there is a, a new Jerusalem, and let me read this in Revelation 21 too. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Who is the bride of Christ? So what if we've always placed this event in the future? What if it's a now event? It's a spiritual event that is, that is happening. And it may also be a physical, I believe it's also going to be a physical event. But we are the bride of Christ. And God will dwell with us, dwell within us. Now it's interesting, the word Jerusalem is, you know, I've had the privilege to study Hebrew in a Messianic Jewish university and been able to read Hebrew, understand Hebrew. There's an ending on this word Jerusalem. You would say this in Hebrew, Yerushalayim. Everybody say that, Yerushalayim. That's how you would say Jerusalem in the Hebrew language. But there's this word on the end of it called, or a, an ending, a suffix, you would call it, called Aim. Yerushalayim, and it means that the word, word is plural. Now, in English, if I have a cat and I add an S to it, I have cats. I have more than one cat. I'm really good at English, by the way. That S makes it plural. The word, the suffix or the ending ayim makes the Hebrew word plural. So it would be better translated Jerusalem, Jerusalem's. Hey, are you going to Jerusalem's? It'd be like if I told you, hey, we're going to Richmond's today. How many Richmond's are there? Where do you live? Eaton's? What? I'm going to take this one step further. Ayim, the ending ayim is particular that it's a double plural. It's specific. Unlike our English plural, but it's specific, it's a double plural. That means most Jewish people and scholars believe there's an earthly Jerusalem and there's a heavenly Jerusalem. There's one that you can see and there's one that you can't see. There's a visible Jerusalem and an invisible Jerusalem. That's why, they're, that's why this word is double plural. So we are the bride of Christ. Are we the city, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven? Jesus says, so the one whose heart is open or to him who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Go ahead and check yourself. All right. Yeah, yeah, it's us. To him who has ears, let's hear what is the Spirit saying. Because the book of Revelation is a book about the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Are we learning more about Jesus and our relationship with him? Yeah then we're following the right protocol to read this book. The last city is the church of Laodicea. How many have heard of the church of Laodicea? The most popular church in the Bible. The one that all scholars, you know, the prophetic scholars, we are the church of Laodicea. We're not going to be on fire. We're going to be dead. God's going to spit us out. Praise God. You understand how this can be a self-fulfilling prophecy that we don't want to agree to? When you read, when Pharaoh was coming against the Israelites, the reason he was oppressing the Israelites is because they were growing rapidly. They were multiplying. What if the enemy is going to come real hard against the church and he's doing that right now is because we're multiplying. We're not shrinking. We're multiplying. So we have to be cautious before we think, oh, no. This is, this is self-fulfilling, so let's just be lazy. Let's just give in to this mindset. So the church of Laodicea is a church that means, Leo means people, and Dicea means righteousness. It could be thought of self-righteous. 
We, I call it DIY salvation, do-it-yourself salvation. How many have met people like that before? The reason people don't worship Jesus in some churches is because they think they're doing their salvation themselves. I know where my source comes from. It sure ain't me. It comes from the work that Jesus did. Why am I so crazy about Jesus? Because I can't do DIY salvation. Jesus did it for me. He is the way, the truth, and the life. It's not by my good works or my righteousness. That's why I love singing about the blood of Jesus. It's more than enough. His blood is what forgives me, what saves me, what stabilizes me. That doesn't mean I'm a lawless person, though. Some Christians think, well, that means I can just do whatever I want. No. You don't change the grace of God into a license for sin. That's what the book of Jude warns about, that these people are distorting God's grace and changing it into a license for sin. Here's my grace card. I can sin all I want. No, grace is an empowerment from God to give you authority over sin. Sin is not just an action. It's a power. And this power was destroyed on the cross 2,000 years ago. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he destroyed not only the guilt and the weight of sin, but he destroyed the power of it from operating in our lives anymore. So we are not the church of Laodicea. We are not a church of the self-righteous people. Jesus says to this church, he says, write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Laodicea, for these are the words of the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. He says this in Revelation 3.15. And let me tell you, this is the most rememberable verses in, about this church. The church of Laodicea, I will, I'm going to go through a few of these today. You guys doing okay? We, are we staying awake, staying alive, staying attention here this morning? Can we give God some praise? All right? God's moving in the book of Revelation. Can I tell you? He's moving. This is something personally we can grow from. But Jesus says, I know all that you do, and I know that you are neither cold or hot. How I wish you were either one or the other. But because you are neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Wasn't oh, that lovely words of Jesus this morning? You're gonna, Jesus is going to spit you out. They actually... Uh, Greek word, he actually says he will vomit you out. Ouch. Like, where's the love right here? He's going to vomit us out. Now, there's a difference between spitting out because that's a decision that you make to spit something out. I, I, I went to grab some yogurt the other day. I like those yogurt drinks. And I was grabbing one of them, and it, it was, you know, in the refrigerator a little too long. And I took a little sip of it. Ah! You know. I, I just spit it out. I mean, I, I, I didn't get sick or nothing. But, you know, what happens is, is there's a misunderstanding of this verse that I want to clarify. And I mentioned this before. But you, I never understood it until I understood that Jesus was talking to a particular city at a particular time with things that were going on that give us understand. Remember, take the scripture in context. There's spiritual meanings, but there's also meanings that were just for the people of Laodicea. Can you put up the map of Laodicea? There's a, a map that talks about two, um, yeah, here we go. Here's Laodicea, and Her Hierapolis and Colossa. There was a letter written to the Colossians, if you know your Bible here. And these cities were about maybe five miles away from Laodicea. So Jesus is referring to them, I wish you were hot or cold. Now, when you study these two cities, you'll find that Hierapolis was known for its hot water. They had, they had hot springs that were medicinal, that you could soak in these things and be healthy and made well. And then there was Colossia, that was known for its cold drinking water that had come from the mountains. And Laodicea suffered an earthquake as well, and so it's very likely that a lot of their water sources 
were discontinued and they had to maybe ship in hot water from Heropolis or cold water from Colossia. But what happens in the transport? It becomes lukewarm. So Jesus is speaking to the church of Laodicea and he says, I wish you were either hot or cold. But because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, for the years, 25 years, as long as I've been a Christian, I've always heard it taught. Hot means you're on fire for God. And cold means you're a heartless sinner. And you've heard preachers say this before. Jesus wants you to either be on fire for him or be a ruthless, heartless sinner. And it doesn't make sense because you're like, well, no, I don't think, I don't think Jesus wants you to be like heartless, cold sinner or on fire. I don't think it's either or. What Jesus is saying here is he says, I want you to be useful water. Hot water is useful. Cold water is useful. Lukewarm water is spit out. He wants you hot or cold. Both are useful. I think that's the right interpretation. The city of Laodicea was located between these two cities, and both of these cities were known for their pure waters. Hierapolis had hot springs, which were considered medicinal. Colossia was known for its cold, refreshing mountain springs. Laodicea, on the other hand, had a bad reputation when it came to water. What is the Lord saying? He's saying, guys, let's be useful. Usually this verse is interpreted to mean be on fire for God or be a total reprobate. That's how I've had it taught to me. Inaccurate teaching. The Laodiceans are told to be useful. So he goes on to say to them, to the Laodicean church, and we're closing up here, we're landing this plane, we're doing all right here. Laodicea was known for three things. They were known for their black wool, they were known for their medicinal eye salve, and they were known for their lukewarm water. And he says to them, Jesus says to them, he says, for you claim the rich, I'm rich and getting richer, I don't need a thing, yet you are clueless that you are miserable, poor, blind, barren, and naked. And what's he speaking to? He's speaking to this group of people that should have the best eyesight, that should have the best clothing, that should be able to see, that should not be cold and naked, but because they're trusting in these natural things instead of their relationship with Jesus is what he is telling them to do. He tells them, so I counsel you to purchase gold perfected by fire so that you can be truly rich and purchase a white garment to cover and clothe your shameful nakedness. He tells you this, he says, for those I love, I repu reprove and discipline. Be, so be zealous and rep repent. When the Lord begins to share with you things in your life that are unpleasing to him, be zealous and repent. It's a good thing. When someone tells me I'm committing this sin and I don't feel bad about it anymore, that's a bad day. That means your conscience has been seared. But when Jesus is saying, I'm calling you up to a higher level, that's because he wants to draw closer to you. It's a beautiful thing. And so he says, be zealous, burn with zeal and repent. Change what he wants you to change because it's the best for you and it means he's wooing you and he's calling you in closer. And so there's a few things as, as we close, I'm going to have Joni come on up, and she's going to close us with a song this morning. But we look into the scriptures, and we've all heard this one before uh, as we close this. Revelations 3.20. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door, and I am knocking. If your heart is open, hear my voice, and open the door, and I will come in, and I will feast with you, and I will dine with you. But how many have heard that over and over before, that Jesus is standing at the door, and he's knocking. Is, is this door that he's knocking at, my friend, is this to the unbeliever or is this to the church? 
But we've always taken this in context that this was to the unbeliever, someone who didn't know Christ. When in fact, this is a message to us as the church to open up the door of our heart and to feast with him, to dine with him. How many know Jesus wants to eat with us and dine with us? And that's something he's asking us as the church to do, to say, yes, I want this war. I want to take the deeper level. I want to, I want to be the overcomer. I don't want to be just a believer anymore. Come on, is this your heart this morning? I don't want to just be lukewarm Christian. I want to be the one that's on fire for God. I want to be the one that's useful to the Lord. I want to be watchful. I want to be devoted. But I want to be the one that says, Jesus, come on in. Come on in. I was, a number of years ago, during a time of worship, I had such an, I just had such an encounter with the Lord because we were, we were singing a song that uh, Jesus Culture sings, and it's, it's, it's a song that says, open up your heart and let me in. And it was always, you know, as, as I was singing, I was just hearing Jesus, Jesus singing to us, open up your heart and let me in. Open up your heart. We'd be singing this chorus over and over. And as we were singing this, this suddenly I just vision. And I, and I saw everything change. And I saw my heart, my person saying to Jesus, open up your heart and let me in. And I saw the Lord open up his heart like a door. And I stepped into the heart of Jesus. And I was inside the heart of Jesus, looking around. It was beautiful. Being in the heart of Jesus. And I invite you this morning, as, as Joni sings over us, is let's take a few moments and draw close to him. She's going to be singing a song that just invites the Lord to come. And I know we, the book of Revelation about the Lord's coming, his second coming, his return. But he's coming today to come into your heart. And I hope that you will come into his heart. And this morning, the new Jerusalem will descend. I'm going to give you one last promise here. You guys ready for one? Let's stand. Come on, let's give Jesus a shout of praise. Come on, how many have ever read the Bible before and you thought, I have never seen that before? Is this legal to preach? Well, it's in the Bible. I didn't discover it on Wikipedia, but it just sounds, it sounds a little too inviting, Lord. Like it, it sounds like good news. It sounds like you are expecting more of me than I thought I was up for. I thought I was just getting forgiven of my sins, but now you're saying something above and beyond what I never thought was possible. I begin to see myself differently because he sees me differently. And he says this in, in Revelations 3.20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He's promising us intimacy and fellowship. Come on. That's from the Son of God. But verse 21, the last one of the last words of Jesus to his church. He's promising intimacy and fellowship in verse 20. But this verse, he's promising us authority and power. He says, he who overcomes, verse 21, I will give to him to sit down with me on my throne. I'm going to read that one more time. This is not a misprint. This is the Bible. He who overcomes. Any overcomers in the house? I will give to him, to her, the right to sit down with me on my throne. <laughs> so I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne.
Thank you for listening. Remember to click subscribe or like to help us continue to reach more people with the message of Jesus. Go to www.igateway.org to learn more. Every church has issues, and God gives us instruction throughout his scriptures how to handle issues in the church, in life in general, but also specifically for the church. And we have had to deal with some things recently as a church. I may have noticed that. And I think a lot of people have been kind of shocked that Gateway Church does things differently than other churches. Can I say this, that we strive to line ourselves up with God's Word. We strive to line ourselves up with God's Word. Do we always do that? No. Do you? No. We are striving. And we had this, this issue that was happening in the, in the Corinthian church. I'm going to jump to them because they had to deal with an issue of sin in their church. And what we find is in the book of Ephesus is that, not the book of Ephesus, but the letter to the, the letter to Ephesus, Jesus says this, I write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Ephesus, for these are words of the one who holds the seven stars firmly in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And then Jesus gives them, he reveals who he is, and then he reveals to them something good. How many know you should always start if you ever have to correct somebody? You should always put your correction in a love sandwich. Saying something nice about them and then bringing something corrective and then saying something loving again. Uh, go ahead and if you have your spouse next to you, give him your elbow just to remember that. All right, that's good. Here you go. So he says this, I know that you have done for me. I know what you have done for me. You have worked hard and persevered. I know that you don't tolerate evil. You have tested those who claim to be apostles and proved that they are not, for they are imposters. So Jesus is commending them for not being tolerant. If you want to fill in your worksheet, he's applauding intolerance. Now look at our church today. Most of the church, if you look at America today, it's the worst sin you can ever commit is not being tolerant. Yet here, in what Jesus is applauding, the Ephesus people, dude, you're not tolerating evil, good job. So if you want the applause from the world, be tolerant. If you want the applause from heaven, be intolerant. We are in a cultural war right now. If you're not sure what to do, listen to the media, and do the exact opposite. <laughs> that's, that's, you don't even need to read the Bible anymore. You just listen to what they're saying, do what they're telling, do the exact opposite of what you do. I'm not saying that. You read your Bible every day. Be a good Christian. So they have tested and claimed that those who are apostles proved they were not, they were imposters. 1 Corinthians 5, it says, it is actually reported there is sexual immorality among you, a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans, for a man has his father's wife. Verse 2, and you are arrogant, ought you not rather mourn and let him who has done this be removed from among you? Paul goes on to say, when you have assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Wow, what's that mean? Let's read that. Let's look at that. Let's study that. 1 Corinthians 5. There was a man who was sexually immoral, who was flaunting his immorality into a church. And he was a leader. And what were the people doing? They were arrogant or they were passive. They did nothing. And Paul rebuked them. And he said, hand this one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. That sounds pretty dark, doesn't it? Right? Sounds pretty harsh. Like, we don't do that in our church. We're nice. Every pastor needs to be nice. So 
leadership has a responsibility to do something. Verse 12 says, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church who you are to judge? So our responsibility is not to be judging those outside the church, but judging those inside. The goal is that we have to make sure that our church is not coming under judgment because we failed to do the right thing. Now, people have accused Gateway of being, Lord, you're just mean. You're just harsh. Where's your mercy? You're not being loving. No, I'm being tolerant and disobedient to the Lord. And I care enough about the church. I don't want to see the church judged. If someone wants to live in a moral lifestyle, they have to live it outside of this church. Has to. Has to. Listen to this. 1 Timothy 5.22. It says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. Now, this does not mean, be, even though I would be careful who you let pray for you, Lace, laying on of hands means to set someone in a position of authority. That's what it means. We pull people up. Pastor Sandy, we, when we anointed her as pastor, we put her hands or we declared, you are a pastor here. We laid hands on her, which means she has authority. We trust her. We want you to trust her. We're saying you can trust her because we put our hands on her. We have authorized her authority. That is a picture. That's one thing we do. Now, what happens is it says, if you are hasty, that means if you just are like, wow, this person is gifted, they're talented, they can preach, they can speak, they can juggle. They can, I mean, I don't know. We say, we got to welcome them in there. We got to give them a position. That's called being hasty and laying on of hands. Putting them into a position that they are, their character is not according to the scriptures and it says if you do that you're taking part in the sins of others you're sharing in their sins how many want to share in other people's sins i don't want to share like your sin and your punishment are your choice so this is where the church are you guys following me so far understanding our mentality titus 3 10 says that you warn a divisive person once then twice, then have nothing to do with them. We've had to deal with some divisive issues. People say, how can you do that? Because the Bible says, if you will not, if you're gonna to continue to be divisive, you have to leave. That's the biblical model. So we see in the book of Revelation that there is a blessing upon them because they were intolerant of evil. They were not passive when they dealt with you. God judges those on the outside. He says, purge the evil person from among you. So this is, if you look at the picture, what happens is, is you have this little star that's been kicked out, put out. But then Satan, they'll be under Satan's judgment, if, but we're still protected. And this is what we do as a leadership team. We want to protect you from people that are not living the appropriate lifestyles. Ivan Tuttle was here two months ago, came to our church, brought a woman here, 42 years younger than he was, told you, some of you, told us he was married to her. We got information that he wasn't. We confronted him. He said, no, we're married. I said, look at this. Okay, well, not really. We're not really married. I told him, you don't repent. We, I will publicly hand you over to Satan for the destruction of your flesh. I told him, you step down from ministry, you get out of ministry, you get back with your wife, you make things right. Because he's, a, he's, a, he's currently still married. And so, this morning, I officially hand Ivan Tuttle over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. So on the day of the Lord, he'll be saved. We have to, we have to.